You probably already learned about me, but in case you haven't, I'm not one to typically deviate from the course. It's pretty easy to guess what passage of scripture I'll be preaching on the next week because it's the one right after the one that I just preached on the previous week. There's a reason for that. There are, there are a few reasons for that, but the biggest reason is this. If your spiritual life is limited to just hearing a preacher, you can only hear what I have to tell you. But if I can give you, if I can give you the skills that when you're reading this on your own, you start to see some of these things for yourself, that will change your life. So I want to be, as far as the text goes, I want to be a little bit predictable about where I'm going next. Because I want you to be able to follow along. In fact, I want you to be able to read ahead. To prepare yourself to say, okay, what, what is here in this? And then what you'll find is, this is what happened for me. Then when you hear a preacher preach on that, you'll likely have already seen a lot of the points that they brought out. But you might see some ones that I don't bring out. And maybe you won't see some that I do. And in that way, we can build each other up. But I mentioned that specifically this morning because obviously our society is in a weird spot, a spot that some could consider to be unprecedented. You know, we've had lots of different viruses, we've had lots of different illnesses, but I have never seen something so big that the NBA has decided to, you know, postpone their season, so big that, you know... uh, all these other different sporting events, you know, they're either being played without an audience in there or they're just not being played at all. You know, I thought that a lot of this stuff was sort of overblown and perhaps it still is, but I can tell you these billionaire sports teams owners don't like to lose money. (laughs) So when they started canceling that stuff, I said, huh, maybe I'll take a, a step back and look at this. But I say that also as well because what we're talking about today is perhaps one of the most important things that you can understand. You know, we're getting close to uh, what we call the Easter season, or what I like to call Resurrection Sunday, where we are talking about the resurrection of Jesus. But it just so happens, guys, I'm not smart enough to plan it out this way, where we are at in 1 Corinthians 15 is talking about the resurrection of the dead. But it's kind of a long chapter, so we're going to break it up and take our time with it. But today we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 talking about the importance of the resurrection. Now, Pastor Cody, how does that relate to this whole coronavirus thing? Well, let me tell you. Why do you think people are so panicked? Why do you think people are so afraid? Hey, you guys are awake this morning. Praise God. People are afraid of death because death is our greatest enemy. Death has conquered every single human being, save for a few, throughout history. We know a couple of examples in the Bible, a man by the name of Enoch, who did not die, but he was simply, he walked with the Lord and then he was no more, for the Lord took him. We know a man by the name of Elijah, who was taken up in a chariot of fire and did not have to face death, but there's one greater than either of those two. Because it's one thing to avoid death as they did, but there is only one man in the entirety of human history who has overcome death. Jesus himself raised multiple people from the dead. Paul raised people from the dead. Peter raised people from the dead. But those men died once again. Only one man has been raised from the dead to fear death no more, for he has completely conquered death. He is the victor over death, and that man's name is Jesus. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for you have conquered death. Lord, the thing that that all of us have a natural fear of, Lord, our greatest enemy, that Lord, your son has conquered death, and that by faith, we can conquer death as well. Please, Lord, help us to understand your word. Help us to understand the importance of this resurrection that we might glorify you in this world and that we might not walk according to fear. I ask in the great name of Jesus, amen. If you'll remember uh, a couple weeks ago, which first of all, big thank you to Shane for for preaching last week. He did an amazing job. And if you hadn't told him that already, make sure you let him know. I I really enjoyed it. I was really edified by that. But if you remember the week before that, we were talking about, uh, Paul was talking about the order of the church. He's setting up how the church is ordered. Now he's going to transition to this next topic because it's it's incredibly important. This is going to be one of the last things he talks about. He says, now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. 
So he says, hey, I already came to you and preached this gospel to you. You believed it, you started living according to it, and you're being saved by it. But then he stops at the end and says, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Now let's pause there. He's used the same phrase twice. What phrase has he used a couple times in a row? In accordance with the scriptures, he's saying, hey, this plan for Jesus to come and do these things, this wasn't just something that came out of nowhere. It was prophesied from the beginning. This was always, always, always God's plan that Jesus would come and he would die for our sins, that he was buried. And then on the third day, he rose from the grave. And then he appeared, that he appeared to Cephas, which is Peter, then to the 12. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still asleep or still alive, though some have fallen asleep. When the Bible says fallen asleep there, what's he talking about? They have died for a time, but he calls it sleep because sleep is something that ends, whereas death is something that in our mind lasts forever, okay? Okay. Then he appeared to James, then to the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he also appeared to me. Now, Paul brings this up because it's also incredibly important because the claims that Jesus has risen from the dead is not just something that a bunch of people made up. He says, Jesus, first of all, he appeared to Peter. He appeared to the 12. He appeared to over 500 people at one time. And most of those are still alive. When he's saying that, he's saying, you can go ask them. Okay. He appeared to James and all the apostles. And then he appeared to Paul. The resurrection of Jesus was witnessed by over 500 people that he was raised from the dead, that death had not conquered him, but that he rather had conquered death. This is not just something that people are making up. Okay, it is something that was eyewitnessed by many people. Now, Paul's gonna make an aside in this next couple of verses. He says, for I am the least of the apostles. He's the last one that he, that he says Jesus appeared to there. Unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. Paul says, I didn't deserve to be an apostle at all. And rightfully so. Why is, why is he saying that though? He's not just using false humility. This is true humility. But what did Paul do before he was a Christian? He was a Pharisee who persecuted the church. He, he tried to round these Christians up, get them to blaspheme God, and then hopefully got them killed. That was his goal. He wanted to put an end to Christianity. And so he says, I'm unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. For on the contrary, ah, my button's sticking over here again. On the contrary, I worked harder I'm going to turn this off. Kelsey, will you uh, help me out? Thanks. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Paul said, because of what God did for me, even though I don't even deserve to be called an apostle, I am what I am, and I worked harder than any of the others, though it was not I, but go ahead and stay on there. I'll let you know when to switch. Thank you, though. It's, praise God, it's great to have a great wife. Amen. Amen. I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that was with me. This is important, okay? We can do nothing without the grace of Jesus Christ. But what you will find is when God works something into you, you have to take the time to work it out. When God puts something into your heart and you just say, ah, I'm just gonna avoid it. You can avoid it for a time, but if you are willing to say, okay, God, I'm taking you seriously, I'm taking this seriously, I'm gonna give you the time that you deserve, a good fruit is gonna come out of that. There is value in hard work in the church, amen? God God has provided everything that we need, but yet there are still roles to be filled in the church. There are some who are carrying a lot in our church right now, and we praise God for them. But but the more people who get involved, the less each person has to carry. I think you've heard me say that already, and I'll continue to say it. The more you get involved, the more enjoyable it will be for everybody if you are willing to work, if you are willing to put in the effort. I have told you, and I will tell the worst thing, 
about being a teacher. The hardest part when I was a teacher was getting people to care. If the kids didn't care about what I was trying to teach them, it didn't matter how much effort I put into my lessons. It didn't matter how much preparation there was. If they didn't care, I could not get them to care. I could try and try, make things exciting, make things interesting. But if they didn't care, that was out of my hands. Church, it's the same way in the church. If you don't care about the gospel, if you don't care about God, I could try, I can... I could be the greatest preacher in the world, which I know I'm not, but if I was the greatest preacher in the world and you didn't care, it wouldn't amount to a hill of beans. Okay, the Israelites had the greatest preacher in the world named Jesus Christ, and many of them rejected him and followed after their own ways. Okay, but if you will take what God gives you and you will invest that and you will work with that and you will be transformed through that, watch what God does in you, watch what he does through you and watch what he does through this church. That's what had happened to Paul. Paul worked incredibly hard for his gospel and for his mission that he was on. All right, go ahead and go to the next slide. Thank you. It says, whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. He says, you guys all, the entire church accepted this when it was originally preached to them that Jesus Christ came and he died for our sins and then he was raised from the dead. Go ahead. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead... How can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? So here's the problem that had come into the church. People had come in along the way and said, yeah, yeah, but that's just more of a story. That didn't actually happen. Now, was this 2,000 years after this happened? No, this was within the lifespan of the people who were eyewitnesses of this event. People were already trying to just say, ah, that doesn't seem super realistic. There's no resurrection of the dead. That doesn't make sense. And the Corinthian church was starting to believe that. He said, when I originally preached to you, I preached to you that there is a resurrection of the dead because Jesus has been raised. And now some of you have turned from that. And he's gonna show them just how crazy that is. Today, the focus is on just how important the resurrection of the dead is. If you do not believe in the resurrection, there are consequences for that. So let's go to the next slide. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. Church, do you believe in the resurrection of the dead this morning? Do you want to go home, so to speak? Amen. Uh, Tears started to fill my eyes as we were singing that song. Because church, I want to go home. I want to go to a place where there is no disease, where there is no sickness where there is no sin. And we believe, church, that that day is going to come for all who are in the faith. But some who call themselves Christians do not believe in that today. They think we're gonna die and we're just gonna go and you know we're gonna fly away and that song is accurate, but they think we're gonna stay there. But church, God created the earth to be inhabited and there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth and we are gonna come back into a perfect world earth. That is our end destination. That's ultimately going to be our home. We're going to go to heaven and then with Jesus and with God, we're going to come back. That's what the book of Revelation talks about. But he says, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. Okay. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. He goes so far as to say, if, if Christ hasn't been raised, all we're doing here is pointless. Next slide. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. So church, not only that, he says, not only is your faith pointless if Jesus hasn't been raised, he says also we're liars and we're misrepresenting God and we're blaspheming if Christ hasn't been raised because we say he's been raised. Next slide. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead is one of the most, if not the most essential point of our faith. Without the resurrection of the dead, the rest of the doctrine simply don't work. Here's why. Without the resurrection of the dead, it says we are still in our sins. Because without the resurrection of the dead, Jesus was sacrificed and died, but he stayed dead. The resurrection is proof that the sacrifice was accepted. Let me prove that for you briefly here. 
The wages of sin is death, right? Okay, did Jesus sin? That's why he was raised from the dead. He didn't sin, so he died and he didn't deserve to die. He was the one person throughout history who did not deserve to die. The resurrection, when he was raised from the dead, that proved that he did not deserve to die. If he deserved to die, he would have stayed dead. But he didn't, so death had no hold over him because he was not a sinner. But as a result of that sacrifice, his death can apply to us who do deserve to die can apply to us who we are sinners, but because the one who died, who was not supposed to die, died, we get to apply his righteousness to our account so that as he was raised from the dead and conquered it, we can conquer it as well. Without the resurrection, that doesn't work. Without the resurrection, we're still dead in our sins. Next slide. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. Church, there's a great difference between a Christian funeral and a funeral in the world. In the world, you go to a funeral and all you've got is a vain hope. Oh, well, maybe they're in a better place. So I hope they're in a better place. What a difference it is when you go to the funeral of a saint. You say, hey, I know they're in a better place. They're not suffering anymore. They're happy now. They're in joy unspeakable and full of glory. But if Christ hasn't been raised from the dead, all who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. They're dead and they're gone and we're never gonna see them again, so to speak. Next verse. If in Christ... We have hope in this life only. We are of all people most to be pitied. Why is that the case, church? Because in this life, we often say no to things that the world says yes to. We deny ourselves certain pleasures. We avoid certain things. We go through, we are persecuted. We suffer in this world for our faith. And he says, look, if, if it's all just for this world, then we're of all people most to be pitied. That's where we're going to leave 1 Corinthians for this week. I want us to understand as we lead up to the Easter season, to the resurrection season, that this resurrection is absolutely essential to your faith. If you do not believe that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, then your faith is in vain. And if you do not believe that we are going to be raised from the dead, then what that means is God is just going to take this earth that he's made and just cast it off and just destroy it. God is not just a destroyer. He is a redeemer. He takes things that are broken and he fixes them. We're very different from that in the world now. It wasn't the case 50 years ago, right? In the world, 50 years ago, if something broke, what did you do? You took the time to fix it. Now, a lot of times something breaks, what we do is we throw it out and we buy a new one. Guys, everything we've been talking about summed up in that as well. Divorce wasn't as common 50 to 100 years ago because if something was broken, mar marriage is still broke just as they break now, but if something was broken, we took the time to try and fix them. Now, eh, I've, I've heard people say as they were leading up to their marriage, now I get the divorce is a reality and it's a sad reality and we've talked about that, but I've heard people even before they get married say, hey, if this doesn't work out though, it'll be okay. You know, this is just my first marriage. That's not how it's supposed to be, church. <laughs> I'm having to learn because the, uh, the material world that we're raised in, I've had to learn because I, if something broke for me, guys, I've told you time and again, I'm not a handyman, so I would just throw things out. And I'm having to learn now, hey, don't just get rid of something just because it's not working for a little bit. We've got a toilet that doesn't work at 100% capacity at home. They have to hold the handle down a little bit longer. I was thinking about buying a new toilet. Guys, you, you don't have to do that over a small problem. You don't have, God thankfully is not just someone who cast us out either. He saw that we were broken and he took the time to send his son to fix us. God is a fixer of problems. He transforms us. He does not just cast us off. Why do, why do we simply cast things off? Because it's a lot easier. God is not just about doing things the easy way. God is willing to do the things the hard way. That is why he sent his son to die. Go to the next slide, please. As I mentioned at the beginning, the resurrection is so important because death is our greatest enemy. Every single one of us from the time we're born, some of us do actions that are a little bit crazy and, and you know, some people, they get a thrill out of those things because they feel like they're cheating death. But we all know 
that death comes for every person on this earth. And it's a sad reality, but it's a reality we can't avoid. Guys, the, I don't think this, this uh, virus that we're seeing is going to lead to a lot of deaths. I don't think that's going to be the case. I think a lot of the precautions are just to be safe because, guys, we don't want one death from this thing. We don't want two deaths from this thing. If we can prevent death, we're going to do everything we can to prevent death. Look, look at our medical field. Everything they're doing, in, you know, modern medicine, they're trying to do everything they can to stave off death. You know, people get gym memberships to exercise because we want to be as healthy as we can to try to keep from dying because death is scary. But church, what I am telling you is that because of the resurrection, death does not have to be something that you are afraid of. I was terrified of death as a kid. I was incredibly cautious because Life is a fragile thing. But church, the resurrection is not fragile. Look at the next verse, or sorry, the next passage here. It's in Romans chapter five. Yet death reigned, in verse 14, from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one to come. Next slide, please. For if, skipping a few verses ahead, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Death reigned from Adam to Jesus, but when Jesus came, Jesus took the throne over death. We are the only faith. Guys, there are a lot of religions in this world a lot of religions, but we are the only faith who can truly claim a risen savior who was confirmed by that many eyewitnesses. Others might try to make that claim, but guys, the Islam is becoming really popular in the world. Muhammad's dead and in the grave. They know where his grave's at. He hasn't risen from the dead. He hasn't conquered death. You know, yoga and the philosophies behind that Hinduism and Buddhism are popular in our world, but the, uh, the, what is his name? Uh, the Buddha, you know, Siddhartha Gautama, the original one there, he's dead and in the grave. Mahatma Gandhi, a big religious symbol, he's dead and in the grave. Jesus Christ is alive forevermore. And if you put your faith in him, you will also live forevermore. Church, as I've said, if it's not important to you, there's nothing I can do about that. But the resurrection is the most important thing. It is the most important thing. It is the, this is what gives us our hope. So my goal for today was to set your minds and to set your hearts on the resurrection. If you wanna share your faith, the resurrection's a great place to start. If you, guys, we're gonna have people in this church in a few weeks that typically only come to church about twice a year, right? You got the, the Easter Christmas crowd. They'll be here for that. And you know what we're going to talk about? We're going to talk about the resurrection. Because guys, I can tell you every single person in the world is scared of death. And Jesus is the only answer to death. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your word, oh God. And I thank you that because of the resurrection, we don't have to be afraid of death. But dear God, I know that fear is still natural for us. Oh God, that it's, it's a natural human emotion to be afraid. But Lord, we read in your word in 1 John that your perfect love cast out all fear. Dear God, by us being in your presence and spending time with you, your love will overcome us and cast out the fears that are within us. So dear God, I ask that you make it important to us, that you make it relevant to us, and that you allow us to, or motivate us to, give it the time it deserves, to give it the attention it deserves. For oh God, we take so many things lightly, but your grace is not something to be taken lightly. The sacrifice of your son is not something to be taken lightly. Let us count it as important as you count it, O oh God, and let us focus on this resurrection that it truly is real to us. Dear God, please guide us as we go throughout our community, throughout this next week, empower us by your gospel, empower us by your Holy Spirit to not be afraid. O oh God, that those who are suffering, those who are panicking, that they might see something different in us, that they might see a peace in us, O oh God, and that way we might serve in our world, O oh God, in this time of crisis. 
I ask this all in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Church, you're going into the war zone this week. <laughs> Plain and simple. Because like I said, I hope you're not too panicked about this, but if you've been to Walmart recently, if you've been to any of these places, guys, people are acting crazy. Be the change, all right? You, you don't have to be afraid. If you need any help, likewise, this is what the church is for. If you need any help this time, if you need any supplies, any resources, and you don't have access to those things, let the church know. We will help you. God has supplied for us so that we can help supply for each other. And that's our big benediction. And my God in Philippians will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. You are dismissed. Have a blessed week.